2 Corinthians chapter 2. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness, sorrow. For if I made you sorry, who is he that maketh me glad but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you, least when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Having wrote unto you, this is the first epistle of 1 Corinthians. He's going to go back into the letter that he that we previously studied that he wrote to the Corinthians. He's going to say that this came with a broken of his heart. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears. 1 Corinthians. I mean, they were a carnal church. They had to be straightened out. They had to have been rebuked. It, it, it hurt Paul, their condition. It hurt Paul that he had to write some things. It broke. The man of God's heart. How many preachers today would care about their people like that? It sounds like he tore up the letter a few times and it just, it was miserable that he had to write those things to correct that church. Out of much affliction, anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. You didn't realize 1 Corinthians was written in tears, did you? He thought Paul was just, you know, at least I come with a rod. No, no, that was tears. You guys are carnal saying, Paul this, Silas this. Well, I'm tears. You want these signs, you want these gifts, charity exalted, tears. You know what's missing from the churches today? The pastors don't care. Paul cared. He wasn't the pastor. He was the founder of this church. They were his people in the Lord. They were his children. And as a father, when he sees children do wrong and go wrong, he is in misery. And he wants to correct them. He wants them to do right. Not that you should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly for you. Listen, I wrote 1 Corinthians I wrote it for you. I didn't bad mouth you. I didn't bash you. I did it because I love you. I want you to do right. But if any hath caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in the past, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man in this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that counterwise, ye ought rather to forgive him. Okay. If any cause grief, he has not grieved me, but in part, that I might not overcharge you all. Now, you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was one guy in the church who was committed a sin that he was, he was with his father's wife. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, here is that same gentleman. Remember Paul said, turn over to Satan. This guy has gotten right. This guy has gone to the church and say, I repent of my sins. And Paul is in joy that this guy has turned to be right. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment. You know, he turned him over to Satan, which was inflicted of many. Everyone was involved in it. So that counterwise he ought rather to forgive him. He's got right. He's repented. Forgive him and comfort him. Give him help. Strengthen him. Let him back in. Least perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overwhelm, over much sorrow. Let him back in fellowship. Let him back in the church. Treat him as a brother again. Guide him. Strengthen him. Grow him. There's some churches out there, you know, a guy commits a sin. And he gets right, truly gets right with God. And, he comes, and he's an outcast. He's forever the, the talk behind the walls. He's the one they gossip about. And you know, that's wrong. Paul, the first one to say in 1 Corinthians, turn that guy over to Satan. Now say, listen, let him back in the church. Love him. Help him. 
Don't let him get in down in misery. Don't let him have over much sorrow. Don't let him get depressed in his sin. Because you know what Satan does to man. He does it to me. I'm a saved, born-again Christian. Satan will bring up those sins in our life that are already under the blood. And you get burdened down what God forgets, what God does not remember because of the blood. It burdens us down and Satan will use it as a tool to get you down. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your Lord toward confirm your love toward him. Take him back. Yes, what he done was sin. You preach about that sin. As far as he, he's gotten right. God forgot about it. You forget about it. Your brethren. No grudges. No blackmailing. Oh, we only had a church like that today with some people. Just take them back. For to this end, for to this end, also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you were obedient in all things. Listen, I told you guys, kick that guy out of the church. I told you guys, I'm praying that Satan goes after him. I want to see what you guys were going to do. I want to see if you were going to keep him in that church fellowship or were you going to get right. And in verse 9, it says, I wrote these things that you do that. And then verses 6, 7, 8, let him back in because he's gotten right. You know, you deterred him, made him think. The church in him brought his conscience and say, you know what? I am doing right. The church in him didn't mean that he could go down the street and find a church that would ravage in his sin. He was an outcast. He was a, 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 an outsider. He could not be in the fellowship of God. And that worked his heart to repentance and getting right. Now he's right. Bring him back in the church and don't treat him as an outcast. I wrote this letter to see what you guys would do. I purposely brought that in, 1 Corinthians 5. To whom, now watch this. Oh, wait. To this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive all. You forgive that guy? God's forgiven him? I forgive him. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. For the Lord, I forgive it. That's it. It's done. And if somebody has done you wrong, and this is the hard thing with man, we don't have the love of God. Somebody has done you wrong and they, they try to get it right and get it right. Receive their forgiveness. Receive their forgiveness in Christ. But for man, it's hard to forget. But we ought not to bring up that memory. Why is it we can't remember things that we're all to remember, but we sure can remember the things we ought not to remember. And if you in Christ, that brother that has offended you, in Christ say, listen, I forgive you, I forget you, you know, just let you know, I may not forget, but... I want in Christ, in Jesus, in God, I want to truly forgive you. You restore a fellowship. You restore a joy again. There is trust. There is character again. Now watch what else happens. At least Satan should get advantage of us. So if you don't forgive one another, after somebody's gotten right, here comes Satan. You know what's funny in Paul's epistles? All the ones he writes. He will say Satan. S-A-T-A-N. He's not afraid to use that word. But you know what's, you know what's funny in this epistle? You can't find hell. Nowhere in the, in the epistles of Paul does he use the word hell. But boy, he'll use Satan. And he uses Satan as, listen, this guy, now remember, this is the guy in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, you turn him over to Satan. Okay, this guy's got right. He, he's repented. He wants forgiveness. He wants to be back in the church. And now here comes Satan. The very being that, that Paul says, I'm going to send Satan after this guy. Now here comes Satan if you don't forgive him. 
Now, I don't know if turning him over to Satan got him right. And Satan bashed him and all that. Or was his conscience. But the lack of forgiveness, there Satan should get an advantage over. Advantage. I mean, he has the winning side. He has the more tools. He has the excess of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan will attack young and old, weak and strong. Read all the Bible characters. He does it by stealth. The Bible calls him a lion. Lions, they say, see black and white and gray. They don't see color. And then Satan, again, looks for the weakness. He looks for the weak. Now, here's a guy, man, he, he's been involved in sin. He feels like an outcast. He wants to get right with God. He's confessed his sin. He's come back to the church humbly. There are going to be probably people talking about him. He's going to not feel right. He's going to feel uncomfortable. And Satan's going to say, that's the one I want. And if I remember correctly, God, that's the one that Paul turned him over to me. And now is the time to go get him. That's the time now the church should stand up and protect this young lamb. He's already battered. He's already got wounds. He's already got a broken leg from his sin and all that. And God's just patched him up. You got to take him on the arms and say, you know what? We can't let Satan have him now because he's clean. He's bonafide. Certified clean sheep, lamb of God, a child of God, clean and new. You got to protect him. We got to protect our, our, our brethren from Satan. We got to make them learn what the word says, what the Bible says. I've done that many times. You know, I tell people about they got the wrong Bible. They're doing the wrong thing. You know, these women preachers on, on Facebook and stuff like that. And I tell, you know, and they don't want to listen. Okay. I've told you what the Bible says. That's all I can do. I'm trying to help out. Many times people say, you know, you should just keep your nose out. I, I want you to know what the Bible says that in your life. You're not doing Bible. And you can't expect God to bless you. This guy was not doing Bible, but then he did Bible and got right. And now Satan it shows up again. Eve, Paul says, Satan showed up. Study where, where Paul talks about Satan in his epistles. Study at what time Satan shows up. A man and woman, a husband and wife. Well, you know what, dear? We're going to fast this week. We're also going to fast the marriage bed. Because this prayer. And then look who pops up. Satan. But there's one thing Paul doesn't preach about hell. Paul preaches about our enemy. He will tell us that we have an armor. An armor for what? Satan. People don't believe that there's a devil. There is a devil, Satan, the old serpent. And he's a fighter. He's wicked. You know, the Bible says that at one point a man, when he goes to glory before the Lord, I don't know if it's after the judgment seat of Christ or absent from the body. At one point, if you do good, it says, oh, I was just going to say it. I opened my mouth to it. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay? That, that, that's a great thing for the Lord to say. You know, Satan's got his ministers out there. We'll see that in 2 Corinthians, I think, 11. And what's the Bible say about any man that, op that will open his eyes in hell? And he died, and they buried him in hell. He lifted up his eyes in torment. You know, Satan doesn't even greet you when you fall into his hell. He won't thank you for damning the thousands, not millions of billions and quadrillions of people. that are in He won't even thank you. And he stands as our enemy. What is the enemy here of Satan? This would be a great study. Paul and Satan. You got right with God. And Satan shows up. You know what anger Satan is when you get right with God? 
You know, the first day you got saved, you angered Satan because you came out of his domain. You came out of his hell. You became a child of king. You're going to worship God and not him no more. You angered him and you are now set a mark by him and his devils in hell. Now, the only way you can relax yourself with Satan is you just sit back, kick back and do nothing. And he has no concern. This man is on fire for the Lord. How do you know he's on fire in the Lord? He was a big bad sin. I don't care what sin he was. It's under the blood and Satan will show up. Satan does not want him to, to continue to get right. Satan does not want you to continue to get right in your sins. And yes, he'll use people to try to defraud you. He'll use people to try, try to bring you down. And there's always someone there, a Judas, that will sell you out. Furthermore, when I came to Trosis to preach Christ's gospel, oh, Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So here's another. So as Paul's going on, he's getting these great doors and openings. I wish I, I'd like to get some more doors. He goes these places, and here's, here's somewhere to preach. And he preaches Christ's gospel. He preaches Christ's gospel. I don't see no doodads. I don't see anything but Christ's gospel. The good news, what is it? We saw it from 1 Corinthians. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and arose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he would use the Old Testament to show Jesus Christ the prophecies. And the door was opened unto me of the Lord. So God opened it. He had nothing to do with it. It doesn't even show he put his, his hand on the doorknob. It just, he was going on doing what he was supposed to, boom. Oh, okay, I'm in a new room. Let's go, let's do. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. So he's looking for brethren. He's traveling around, hey, you know, somebody's here. Titus should have been here. I never did found him. I got to keep going, though. I missed him. I was too late. He was too early. And it's going to happen. Now thanks be unto God, which always, always, always causes us to triumph in Christ. And then we just have a bad suffering, bad tribulation, bad trouble, chapter 1. And we just had all those things, man, you're in trouble, you, you, and then Satan's going after you. But always triumph. Always triumph. Always causes us to triumph in Christ. In Christ. It has to be in Christ. You're not going to triumph in the world. And you're not going to triumph in the church, the building. And you're not going to triumph at the job. Unless you're in Christ. And maketh manifest the Savior of, of his knowledge by us in every place. Everywhere he's going, and those open doors, those places he's preaching, God is pleased. And they're getting over all this tribulation, trials, and problems. So there's mountains, and there's valleys. Valleys are chapter 1, mountains verse 14. But there'll be more valleys than mountains. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. I like that. We smell good to God. You know what he said in Romans 10? He says, our feet are beautiful. So we're, we are something to God, even though we're nothing but a piece of dirt balls. We are always caused us to try and incorrect a sweet swaver of Christ. Now see, in order to be good in the eyes of God, it has to be Christ. If there's no Christ, we don't smell good. Our feet are not beautiful if we don't carry the gospel of peace. And if you got the worldly means of, 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 of your service, the worldly means of doing something for God, that is not beautiful. For we are to God a sweet Savior of Christ in them that are saved. 
and in them that perish. Well, that's the kind of... We're all to smell good to other Christians. And then we ought to have that sweet savor to the ones that are perishing. He said, what is perish? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish. So we got the save and we got the loss here. If there's one thing that lost people do not like is they do not like a Bible-believing, preaching Christian. And yet in the back of their mind, in the back of their heart, in the back of their conscience, they, you know, if you were to say a cuss word, they would, oh, they know what our conduct is. They know what it is to be a Christian. Our lives to them, even though they don't like it, they, you know what, you're doing right. That's what makes me mad. You're perfect. That's what makes me mad. You're taking God's side. That's what makes me mad, but you're doing it. And in the back of their conscience, they'll know that God approves of what you're doing and not me. That's why they're angry and feisty. Because what they got doesn't work. And then again, when they stand at the great white throne judgment, we have told them exactly what they need to do by the truth. Christ's gospel, verse 12. They've got to stand before God in Christ's gospel that I preach and have to shout off amen as God casts them off the lake, lake of fire. Hey, that guy told me the truth. That guy's not guilty. I'm the guilty party that perishes. Now imagine if you get these ministries with these doodads added along. And you stink before God. You're going to stink before those that perish. Uh, you, you told me to say this prayer. Why am I going off in the lake of fire? You, I can think of some cuss words you might want to add. I bet you those people that do get ca cast off in the lake of fire are thinking they're saved by just saying this prayer. I bet you they will be cussing at those people that did that, that junk. I mean, they're not saved. They're not regenerated. They're still lost in their... Imagine someone that you lied to do about salvation cussing you out as they go in the lake of fire. That doesn't smell good for God. The Bible says that God said that pleasures him in the Psalms. I'm not quoting this right. But the death of his saints. Well, here's a death of a sinner going into hell. That does not make God smell good. That does not please God. But it all comes to Christ's gospel. Being always triumph in Christ. We are a sweet savior of Christ. You be in Christ. You're highly exalted because of Christ, not us. Well, you think you are a holy roller only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ? In my own nature what I am? No. Two to one, we are the savior of death unto death. And to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? One gets life by what we say. One gets death by what we say and reject it. One person, we preach Christ's gospel. They believe on it. They get life. Phew, they love it. They're saved. They're born again. They're happy. They're going to glory. They're going to get a new body. We're going to get New Jerusalem. Always singing. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more anything like that. To the one that rejected the gospel. Misery. Torments. Yet the word of God is right. They had the opportunity to hear it. What about the heathen? What about them? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Now get this one. But as of sincerity. All right, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. You've heard of modern Bibles, right? How they remove and add things to the Bible. They say, and I don't know, this is written about 60 AD. You know what Paul just told you in, in 2 Corinthians 2, 17? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. There are people changing the word of God right when he's living. 
Most definitely the Old Testament, they're changing. And they may be even changing to some of the Gospels that are written, or maybe it's on the, the epistles. that Maybe maybe someone's taking Paul's letters and changing them. Already, approximately 60 A.D. is what is the date in the Schofield Bible. I don't know what it is. Already in 60 A.D., we talk about modern Bible. Bibles are already being corrected when Paul is living. And he knows it. And he tells us. So he brings into this thing the ministry, the triumph of ministry. There are people getting saved, 14, 15, 16. There are people going to hell, 14, 15, 16. And then on top of it, he tells you there are people changing the Bible. And what was the cause? Verse 12, Christ's gospel. In the works of the ministry, people are getting saved. In the works of ministry, people are going to hell. And then we have people who are changing the word of God. And there's a lot between verse 12, which says Christ's gospel, and verse 17, for uh, which corrupt the word of God. That corrupted word of God, I'm going to tell you right now, maybe God will, will put it as a bird, wood, hay, or stubble. But that, that corrupted word of God, the modern Bible, I don't think you can get saved by it. Because you've got to have the word to be saved. We've seen that through Acts. We've seen that in Romans. And if you get something that's added and subtracted, that's not the word. For, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God speak we in Christ, saying if they corrupt the word of God, they are not speaking in Christ. So let's look at what we have in Christ. We have Christ's gospel, verse 12. We have the triumph theme of Christ in verse 14. We have the sweet Savior of Christ in 15. And we are to speak Christ in verse 17. Your ministry, lock, stock, and barrel, better be Christ, God's Christ approved. Anything other than that? It's not approved. So we've gone from a man. We've gone to why he wrote 1 Corinthians. We've gone to a man that was vile in a wicked sin. That got right. Corrected himself. Repented of his sin. Bring him back into church. You better realize that there's an enemy out there. He's called Satan. We're preaching the gospel. We've had a great door of opening for preach the gospel. There are people getting saved. There are people not getting saved. And there are people taking the word of God and correcting it. In chapter 2. A man that's fallen to sin gets right. You get back to him. You help him. There's Satan. When God opens up a door for you, you take Christ and go through that door. Don't take anything else. And then Bible... Modern Bibles been around since Paul. Nothing new. It wouldn't even shock Paul if you saw him, if you showed him a modern Bible. Yeah, that happened in my time too. 